To be honest with you, personally, I would be willing to take that risk if I could go back in time. Good morning, friends. Today, I'm going to tell you about one hack that can make almost anybody grow taller. But before I do, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already, like the video, and comment on the video for the sake of the algorithm. Now let's get started. Recent genome-wide association studies on height have revealed that height is a highly polygenic trait determined by hundreds of SNPs. And in fact, these hundreds of SNPs still only explain about 20% of our height incidence. Height is also highly affected by our lifestyles, our endocrinology, and our early experiences in life, which is why I've been really looking into it since I started having children. Since I always like you guys to also learn with me as I'm researching, I've been compiling the research for a video on human height. Not only will the video become the most comprehensive video ever made on human height, but I honestly think it'll be even more comprehensive than any single research paper on the subject. This morning I was about midway into the research when I decided that maybe I should release an earlier video to introduce you guys to the subject so that it's not too much to take in at once. And that takes us to this video. Have you ever noticed in your teenage years in high school and then when you went to college that some of your friends continued to grow? In fact, some people grow into their mid-twenties without a pathology, whereas there's another kind of growth that's almost infinite that's pathological and genetically determined. In in fact, you can induce a phenotype that resembles this genetically determined phenotype where people continue to grow into their 40s in yourself with a single drug and that's what I'm going to tell you guys about today. But none of this will make any sense unless we briefly talk about anatomy. In particular, we really need to understand what a growth plate is. I bet you've heard the term before and not known what it was. I was also like that. I've used the term and not really understood what it was. Now really briefly, longitudinal bones in your body, like your femur, that's your thigh bone, they're a straight piece of bone that has a kind of cell in it called osteoblast. Those are the normal cells that are in bone. You don't really have to know what an osteoblast is. I just thought to mention it. But anyway, you basically have these long bones that are capped on the outside by two other bones. The, the innermost bone is called the metaphysial bone, whereas the outermost bone is called the epiphysial bone. In between those two bones is a layer of collagenous tissue called the epiphysial plate or the growth plate. And the epiphysial plate or the growth plate is actually made of chondrocytes. Those are the cells that normally exist in connective tissue like collagenous tissue. This is collagen. So you have a long bone. At the, on the outside, it's, they're capped by two bones. In between those bones is a piece of collagen. That's what we call the growth plate, that collagen. In fact, we can also distinguish among parts of the growth plate. In particular, there are three sections. So if the main bone is here, this is our femur, we're holding it. The, the section closest to the femur and the epiphyseal plate is actually called the hypertrophic region. The next outermost region is called the proliferative region. And the one after that is called the resting region. Growth happens in the hypertrophy region. In our developmental years, the epiphyseal plate still exists. And what it does essentially is modulate the growth of the bone long over time. In fact, what's really happening is that growth plate, which is made of collagen, essentially transforms into bone as it goes along. This growth plate made of collagenous tissue disappears toward the end of our development. In fact, this has been a, the cause of the disappearance has been a major mystery to academics for a very long time. There have been many theories about why or how this growth plate disappears, including that it, that the cells there commit apoptosis or that there's an autophagic response, autophagy, you've probably heard of that before, or that the cells trans differentiate. There's many theories. We'll get into that in the full video. But the important thing to know is that at some point toward the end of our puberty, usually, this, this growth plate disappears. It turns into, it ossifies in some way, turns into bone, and you no longer have a growth plate. Therefore, you cannot actually extend these longitudinal bones past a certain point. Moreover, these growth plates experience what's called senescence before they disappear. I've talked about senescence many times on the channel, but for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, senescence is really a protective mechanism to prevent our bodies from committing what's called hyperplasia, dividing, the cells keep dividing endlessly, because that could be pathological for us. So when cells divide a certain number of times, and it's not just that honestly, it's also our hormonal environments in the body, our experiences in life, our oxidative stress, but there's a certain number of cell divisions depending on our bodies, at which point if we live long enough, every cell in our body will either die or become senescent. This this point is called the Hayflick limit. If a cell dies, we don't really have to worry about it. It's, it's called apoptosis, it disappears. But if it becomes a senescent cell, it still exists and may cause us some health problems, but it ne no longer exists as the former cell that it was. It acts uh, bizarrely not like the cell it used to be. Just for those that don't know, our cells will come from stem cells originally. They differentiate and proliferate into certain kinds of cells like we talked about osteoblasts or chondrocytes which are in the collagenous tissue. When one of those cells becomes senescent, it no longer functions properly according to that kind of category of cell that it was. So basically, before these growth plates disappear, they become senescent. And we need to know how do these growth plates become senescent? Because if they don't become senescent and they don't die, they remove the upper limit on your growth potential. In fact, that person you were thinking about earlier, your 
your friend who grew into his mid twenties, he, the difference between him and you is that your cells became senescent before his. Now this could be because you had more oxidative stress as a child, so you aged faster or something like that. But the main reason for this to happen is because of the expression of estrogen. As I've been researching about the determinants of human height, and there's a lot of things I've been looking into like diet and all kinds of interesting hormones, including leptin and things you wouldn't think about. I've been shocked to see how powerful estrogen is in modulating the senescence of growth plates. In fact, I don't really mean that it's just powerful. I mean, it's almost the only determining factor for the senescence of growth plates. By itself, it creates senescence and without it, it doesn't happen. For those that are unfamiliar, estrogens are mostly known as female hormones. They're higher in women than they are in men, but in men, they're not produced by our sex organs like they are in women. They're produced from a conversion mostly of testosterone to estrogen. About 80% of man's estradiol comes from peripheral conversion of testosterone into estradiol, estradiol being that main important estrogen. And this conversion happens with an enzyme called aromatase. And for those that were wondering, there is aromatase activity in bone in particular. So there's local conversion of androgens into estrogens around our bones. Though there's also conversion of testosterone to estrogen directly in our testicles called the gonads. Anyway, from now on, when I say estrogen, I'm going to be referring to estradiol. And if I say estradiol, I'm talking about that one individual estrogen from the class of estrogens, the most important one. Anyway, where does estradiol signal at? It signals at the estrogen receptor alpha, the estrogen receptor beta, and the G protein coupled receptor, which is called GPER. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is local aromatase activity in the growth plates themselves, but they also express the estrogen receptor alpha, the estrogen receptor beta, which doesn't seem to do anything with growth in humans. And then it also expresses the GPER, that G protein coupled estrogen receptor. So what does estrogen do for our bone growth? Well, one of the things it does is cause mineral retention in the bones. You probably heard of women going through menopause and then being more likely to get osteoporosis. And this doesn't just happen to women. It would happen to men also if they had a severe estrogen deficiency for a long time. Although I should comment on a couple of things. One is that your bone mineral retention in early life before puberty is the biggest determinant of later incidence of osteoporosis. But also men are somewhat protected from osteoporosis because of androgen signaling. Androgen signaling also makes the bones retain more minerals and makes them thicker and stronger. The other two things that estrogen does to bone development and skeletal growth over time are really our focuses here. One is that estrogen levels speed in the process of puberty. They speed in development, but they also bring about the end of puberty. So without estrogen levels, the growth spurt in puberty is inhibited, but also the end of puberty is inhibited, such that growth hormone levels and IGF-1 levels and other hormones continue to make the person grow later in life. So how does estrogen cause this growth spurt? It may be because of its potentiation of growth hormone or IGF-1 signaling. It seems that low levels of estrogen are needed for growth hormone and IGF-1 to have their maximum result during our puberties. But estrogen signaling is not necessary for our continued growth. It's only necessary for the growth plates to fuse. You can see from this rodent study that in fact rodents continue to grow without any estrogen signaling. Actually, this is an excellent opportunity to talk about some of the problems with rodent studies. You see, rodents don't have growth plate fusion. They don't experience it. Rabbits do, humans do, but rodents don't. And this is one of the reasons the exact mechanisms by which estradiol causes growth plate fusion only was discovered in the last 10 years or so. So to learn more about how estrogen levels, either high or low, or estrogen signaling at the receptor, either high or low, may affect our development in life, let's look at some common genotypes and see what their associated phenotypes are. By the way, a genotype is just a set of polymorphisms that someone may have genetically, and a phenotype is a kind of behavior or appearance. First of all, the mutations in the aromatase enzyme come from a mutation in the gene called CYP19A1. That's a CYP enzyme 19A1 called aromatase that transcribes aromatase in your body. In people that have loss of function mutations in aromatase, where they have reduced aromatase activity, they have elevated levels of the hormones that come from the pituitary to tell the testicles to produce testosterone. Specifically, they have elevated levels of luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, that's LH and FSH. They consequently have elevated levels of testosterone and their estradiol levels are undetectable. In these people, when they're given the hypothalamic from the hypothalamus hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is supposed to cause the release of LH and FSH, they produce a very robust LH signal with a slightly reduced FSH signal. These people who have a genetic loss of function in the aromatase enzyme have rock bottom estradiol levels. Despite their very low levels of estradiol and high levels of luteinizing hormone, they usually have normal testicles, although some do have abnormally large or abnormally small testicles. For those of you who have been watching my channel for a while, you probably heard of the Leydig and Sirtoli cells of the testicles. The Leydig cells traditionally respond to luteinizing hormone, LH, and the Sirtoli cells respond to FSH, although actually the Leydig cells also respond to FSH. Anyway, these people with a loss of function in the aromatase enzyme often have Leydig 
Leydig cells that are perfectly healthy, but Sertoli cells that have some slight pathologies. So this can affect their sperm quality, though it usually doesn't. So how do people with aromatase deficiencies look? They're unusually tall, they often have unusually large wingspans compared to their height, and they also have unusually large ratios of their upper body to their lower bodies. They experience increased bone turnover earlier in life, and if they're not treated, they may experience osteoporosis later in life. They are also usually hyperinsulinemic and also slightly insulin resistant. But what's really remarkable about men with aromatase deficiency is that they're almost always unusually tall and almost always do not experience epiphyseal fusion. That means their growth plates never fuse. And this has been replicated in people without an aromatase deficiency with the use of a single drug, an aromatase inhibitor. Aromatase inhibitors are used to reduce the senescence of the growth plates and extend the potential for development among people with dwarfism. Before we move on, let's talk about two more genotypes. First of all, the estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor beta. There are polymorphisms in the estrogen receptor alpha that cause it to have a loss of function also. These people display a similar phenotype to the aromatase deficient people, but it's a less healthy one because when the estrogen receptor doesn't work, they can't get signaling there and they usually end up infertile. In fact, the way you can differentiate it is this. When you have polymorphism, in the estrogen receptor, those people are estrogen resistant. On the other hand, the people with aromatase deficiency are actually very estrogen sensitive. By the way, mutations in the estrogen receptor beta don't seem to have an impact on height. Before we move on, the final genotype. What does it look like when we have excess aromatase activity genetically? Well, those people are marked by, they have normal sexual differentiation, but they have smaller gonads. They often develop gynecomastia in puberty. They're also often unusually tall when they're younger, but they get less tall compared to other people when they get older because they enter into puberty early and get out of it quickly. By the way, most of these people either have duplications or inversions or deletions of that same gene, the CYP19A1 enzyme that cause it to have more mRNA transcription in the body. Now, before we move on to more practical things, I have to briefly mention the exact mechanism by which estradiol causes that senescence of growth plates, since it's only been discovered recently. To understand the mechanisms, I have to briefly introduce you to a protein called Nestin. Nestin is a protein often found in progenitor cells, like mesenchymal cells. Those are the cells that originate the growth plate tissue. Nestin is required for these cells self renewal proliferation and cell cycle progression. In particular, nestin is the preferred intermediate filament for bone marrow mesenchymal cells in their cell division. And nestin levels in late puberty decline at the same time that this epiphyseal fusion and the senescence of the epiphyseal plate, the growth plate, occurs. Now there's a gene called EZH2 that codes for a histone methyltransferase. It's called the enhancer of zest homolog 2 and it's controlled by estradiol. EZH2's gene transcription represses the transcription of other genes that are involved in the production of senescence of these growth plates, such that a reduction in the transcription of this gene, EZH2, is associated with the senescence of growth plates. In fact, a mutation in this gene, which causes its overexpression, is associated with Weaver syndrome, a syndrome in which people are unusually tall and have unusually big heads. Anyway, we finally got down to the mechanism. Estrogen causes our growth plates to fuse because it inhibits the transcription of EZH2. When EZH2 is inhibited, those genes that cause senescence get transcribed. In turn, our growth plates turn senescent and eventually ossify and we get stuck at that height. Although I should add a caveat. The older you are, when estrogen peaks, the quicker your growth plates will fuse. So for example, say you were one of those people with aromatase deficiency. Whereas if a four-year-old was given very high estrogen levels, it would take several years until their growth plates fused. So it is a bit age dependent. So if you were to use an aromatase inhibiting drug to lower your aromatase activity, to have lower estrogen levels, to continue to grow later in life, what estradiol or E2 level would you target? Well, let me tell you. One study found that 12 and a half year old boys average about 21 picograms per milliliter of estradiol. One year later, the average became 36, and by the age of 16, the average was over 60 picograms per milliliter. Well, personally, if I could go back in time and do this myself, I would try to get my estradiol level to be around 10 or 15 picograms per milliliter at its maximum. Now, are there dangers associated with this? Well, I mentioned the actual dangers to you, the potential effect in the short term on infertility and the actual effects on bone mineral density, but this all depends on how long somebody has very low estrogen levels. On the other hand, there are some behavioral effects that we should be concerned about a little bit. Well, the first thing is your brain may develop a little bit differently. If I were back at, as a 12 year old, I would probably do this, but I would keep in mind that the risk is that I may be, for example, more hostile for the rest of my life, 
maybe slightly more anxious. And why is this? Because of the downregulation of the serotonin system, which estradiol also modulates. At the same time, estradiol inhibits the EZH2 gene, which that gene actually upregulates neurogenesis in adulthood. So there may be a compensatory measure because serotonin also modulates our brain growth factors. Serotonin also not only makes us more agreeable people and agreeable men in particular, but it's one of the governing hormones for what's called neurogenesis in the brain, the creation of new cells in the brain. But interestingly, estradiol also negatively modulates that EZH2 and EZH2 also modulates positively brain derived neurotrophic factor. And in fact, is very important for our adult neurogenesis. And there's also another concern, which is cardiovascular health. Personally, I think that if you're very genetically predisposed toward hypertension, maybe inhibiting estradiol for a couple of years may actually cause you to develop hypertension because estradiol is a vasodilator. It expands the blood vessels. It's also an antioxidant and it does many other things, but this is all dose and duration dependent. So for example, if I inhibited estradiol from the age of 10 until 20, I may miss out on some brain development very significantly. But if I likely inhibited it for a couple of years, to be honest with you personally, I would be willing to take that risk if I could go back in time. And not only for height, estradiol has other effects in males during puberty that are, in my opinion, undesirable. One of them is it is probably one of the causes of the inhibition of phallic growth, such that if I had lower estradiol levels in puberty, my penis would have grown larger, not just because of the inhibitory effect on testosterone synthesis of having estradiol. Remember those aromatase deficient people, they had high testosterone levels, but also because it ends puberty. Therefore, it determines how long your penis can actually grow significantly for. And estrogen plays the main causal role in the development of gynecomastia during puberty. And I developed a small case of gynecomastia that bothered me a lot during my teenage years. I just didn't know how to deal with it. Now, I would not use a selective estrogen receptor modulator, a CIRM, like tamoxifen or raloxifen. Why wouldn't I? Because of two reasons. First of all, as we saw from the estrogen receptor alpha polymorphisms, those polymorphisms are more associated with infertility than the aromatase deficiency. But more importantly, the CIRMs have disparate effects on cells. Depending on the cell type, they affect the estrogen receptor differentially. So for example, tamoxifen actually induces cellular senescence in the growth plate very quickly, rapidly. Actually, I wasn't going to mention that, and I'm glad I did, in case somehow somebody in that age group sees this video, although I've restricted it, they should know that tamoxifen, Nolvedex, could completely inhibit their growth. So what's the long and short of it all? Well, the reason we stop growing is because our growth plates, which are made of collagen, turn into bone. The way they turn into bone is due to cellular senescence. The cellular senescence is governed by estradiol. And estradiol in turn inhibits EZH2, a gene that is protective against senescence. And when it's inhibited, senescence-related genes get transcribed. More importantly, estrogen levels, that is particularly estradiol, are the only factor that we have to control to completely inhibit the senescence from happening. While there are many other factors that may influence the rate to senescence of these growth plates, it's only estrogen that's necessary. That means if you lower estrogen, levels by halting the activity of the aromatase enzyme with the use of drugs called aromatase inhibitors, your growth plates will not fuse. And then depending on many other factors that influence the velocity of your increasing height, you will eventually get to the height that you desire. Anyway guys, thank you so much for bearing with me. I look forward to talking to you more about height in the full video.